Hello financial investors and welcome to the channel. My name is Brent and today we are going to be doing our Tuesday buys for February 18th, 2020. Prior to get into the stocks that we're going to be buying today, we're going to look at last week's index changes for the week, the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, and the NASDAQ. We're also going to be looking at the dividends that were paid out within the M1 Finance account last week. I believe it's one of the largest weekly payouts that I've received in that account. And then we'll dive into the three companies I am planning to add more to my portfolio of and cover their chart information and also look at stock futures. So quite a bit of information we'd like to cover today. If you are brand new to the channel, I would highly appreciate if you do hit that subscribe button below. I cover the stock market, dividends, personal finance. If you're interested in any of those, you know, subscribe to the channel. If you have any comments or questions, go on over this video, a stock M1 Finance, Merrill Edge, or just want to ask a general question, provide some feedback or upcoming video idea, drop it into the comment section. I do read and apply to all comments. And of course, if you do find this video helpful, enjoyable, you know, entertaining, hit that thumbs up. That always helps out this channel. And with that said, let's go ahead and get into the video. So right now, what I want to show you right off the bat is market is open overseas. Uh, right now, if we kind of watch this here for just a second, you'll see that London and Germany are currently open and they are negative. London down 0.27%, Germany down around 0.65%. Nike, I'm sorry, Japan and Hong Kong, I read this right here. Uh, Japan and Hong Kong, they ended Friday down around 1.4% and 1.47%. Now, how are the markets on Tuesday going to be? Is there a way that we can see that? Well, I've been watching stock futures. It's one o'clock in the morning and that's 110 on Tuesday. So, you know, just a few hours until the market opens up. Stock futures for the S&P are down 0.43%, NASDAQ 0.89%, and the Dow Jones down 0.47%. So I'm definitely pretty excited. It means that the market's going to open red. That means that whatever I'm planning on buying today is going to be buying it at a lower price when the market opens because it's generally going to gap down just a little bit, maybe in some of these stocks as well, these individual companies. But hopefully throughout the rest of the week, we'll kind of see how it plays out. I would really like to see this market pull back 5, 10, 15%. I don't see the market pulling back more than 5% just kind of retesting some of you know getting some more support around that let's see let's jump over into the s p 500 and we'll kind of cover this and we'll kind of look at where the support level has been and what i would like to see here so the s p 500 last week put on 8.84 percent put in it back you know obviously it's positive again just a short time ago just a few end of january we fell into the negative at the very end of january in February alone, we have made up and recovered, put on an additional, you know, basically recovered and put on there. Ending currently here to date up 4.6%, uh, 4.62%. So it's been in a crazy recovery. We can see intraday on Thursday. Thursday, we opened lower on the day, but we actually trended higher, broke to some new all-time highs intraday, and they kind of broke down towards the end of the day, getting kind of weaker. And didn't quite close at some all-time highs there. But overall, we are still five points away from all-time highs here of 33.85. So very crazy. We're just five points away. I do, I do think that we are in a state right now where we are going to continue to see new all-time highs on a week or month basis just because of how the Fed has been pushing more money into the markets. Interest rates are continuing to sort of fall and kind of flatten out. We're seeing a flattening curve, a flattening yield curve, and kind of interesting to kind of see that in, in you know, playhouse. I do think that the market is going to continue to move higher and not lower. Dow Jones had a bit of a rougher week. Tuesday basically flat, but Thursday gap down, didn't trend as high as the S&P for the day and actually closed down 0.43%. Friday continued to go further. This is, I think this is off earnings because we can see big gap ups here end of day. I think something announced here on Monday after, you know, after hours gapped it up, 
gapped it up on Tuesday after hours. If you had sold because you got nervous towards the end of Tuesday, you would have missed a nearly 1% return here. You know, market gapped up 1%. It only trended a little bit higher on the day, maybe put it on about 10%, uh, point 10% additional. So you've already missed out on a good chunk of return just because maybe getting cautious and selling out early. So that you've got to be watching out for these gap ups. You know, a lot of the stuff that happens in the market happens after hours. So while in a good day, you might see a change of 0.6%, 0.94%. In the after hours, you might see a big swing of, say, 2% or or so. Maybe not in S&P or the indexes as a whole, but in companies themselves, individual. So the Dow Jones is up 0.41% on the five-day change. Here today, this is in last place as far as performance. And five-day change up 3.01%. The NASDAQ is killing it there right now. <laughs> five-day change up 1.07%. Year today, this one is almost double what the S&P is at, up 8.45%. I've seen a lot of investors choosing to invest in the NASDAQ, ticker symbol QQQ, versus investing in the S&P or Dow Jones or just other companies. They are pouring their money into, I think it's you, no, what is it? TQQQ, which is a three times leverage fund. Very risky as you get the same effect backwards. So if the market pulls back, as it is right now, say the NASDAQ pulls back 1%, you're going to lose about 3% by being invested in TQQQ. So very interesting. So as far as what I'd like to see here, over the past six months, where has the market you know, really gone? It's gone nowhere but up. August, we had a bit of a rocky there, but guess what? We moved to higher highs. Again, we downtrended, had a bit of a rocky point here, double bottom. And what did we do? Recovered and moved to new all-time highs. Here in December, again, we kind of did almost not a double bottom. We actually had some extra support here and moved to new higher highs. And here in the end of January, we had a bit of a double bottom again. And we are continuing to move to all-time highs. I do think we are going to continue to kind of see this play out. I'm not sure how much further we're going to go. You know, we could put on another 10, 20, 30% here in 2020. I really haven't looked at too many of the company earnings outside of just my own portfolio. So I'm not sure how many of the other companies are actually doing as far as earnings grow uh, going. You know, are they growing their earnings? Are the earnings decreasing? So that's not something I'm kind of paying attention to, but I maybe should. But... That is what I wanted to cover there as far as the S&P, Dow Jones, and NASDAQ. Let me know in the comment section below, where do you think the market's going to be going from here on in 2020? Do you think we're going to be ending the year negative or do you think we're going to be ending it positive? And then kind of give an estimate if you would. So the S&P, I'm sorry, my M1 finance account last week or my wife's M1 finance account last week put on in a single week, I think the largest payout that it has received since its open, you know, its creation back in January of 2018. If we count up all the dividends that were received, which I've done here, starting with Apple at $2.13, Main Street Capital of 80 cents, Tanker Factory Outlet there, 9 cents and 17.75, Avi $10.84. We then have Clorox at 0 0.56 and Eaton Vance $1.53. In a single week from there, from the 14th, you know, basically the 13th and the 14th, we were paid out $33.70. I think this is one of the largest dividend payouts, and it's going to continue to grow year after year as these companies have raised their dividend on a year by year basis. And just, it's pretty nice. You know, I, I think it's interesting as. We're starting to see larger and larger dividend payouts getting received from these companies, being reinvested into these companies, which is going to increase the dividend payout in the future anyway. So it's it's nice to see that compounding effect. So if we see up at the top, we have $149.08 to split between three companies. I do plan on buying three companies split between three. 149 by three is roughly $50. I think it's maybe $49.70 or something like that split between three. So we'll kind of uh, go towards those specific companies. Now, I do want to kind of showcase Walgreens here. A couple weeks ago, I planned on buying Walgreens. I said, you know, have two or three weeks to begin buying Walgreens, kind of get the equity up to where I want it. I completely forgot that President's Day was a day, you know, it was coming up. 
when the stock market would be closed. You know, I work at a financial institution. You would think I would know these things, but I completely blanked it out. I didn't know until Thursday or Friday that I wasn't going to be working on Monday and that the market was going to be closed. And then I just realized that Walgreens is going to ex-dividend on Tuesday, today, and I did not have the opportunity to just kind of buy more of Walgreens because it is going to ex-dividend today. So I did make that dividend. It shows right down here that it went ex dividend on the 18th, which is today. So, happy birthday, Walgreens. No, not really, but. And uh, I won't be buying more of Walgreens today. So, what three companies am I buying today? Well, I'm planning on buying ticker symbol LANC. This is Lancaster's Colony Corp. This is the major, uh, food major diversified company yielding right around a 1.82%, 57 years of dividend growth, and a low payout ratio of 51.22%. The other company here I am planning on buying is Genuine Parts. This one has a 3.16% current yield, a payout ratio of 51.71%, again, fairly low. Dividend growth of 63 years, so very nice. It is going ex dividend here right around the 7th of March. Lancaster is also going ex dividend right around the 7th of March. I'm expecting that. And my third company is going ex dividend on the 14th of March, and this is Waco Group. This is a textile apparel, footwear, and accessories. They own a number of brand, uh, brand names. This one has a starting yield of 4% payout ratio of 61.94% and has been growing and paying out dividends for the past 38 years. So those are the three companies I am planning on buying. We're going to go ahead and jump into some of their information here as far as where they are currently at in the time frame. I've kind of done this with some of the dividend aristocrats and we'll kind of go in and kind of showcase where these are at and why I've begun to kind of buy into these in my portfolio. So starting with Lancaster Colony, ticker symbol LANC, this one is trading near all-time, I'm sorry, near all-time lows, basically almost for the low. It's about about average, actually, not all-time lows. All-time lows would have been right back in this area. So it's not trading at absolutely lows. It's not trading at highs. It's at $153.55, giving it a starting yield of 1.73%. You can see here just a while back in maybe August time frame, this one was starting around 1.9%. So I'm not getting the best deal. I just started buying this, I believe, back in January. I wanted to add some new positions to my portfolio that I believed were looking like a value with uptraining financials. And I decided to kind of add this one into my portfolio. So not at the bottom, not at the top, as far as where they are at in the one year. Looking at them over the past 10 years, we can see here that they kind of peaked out around $180 and they came and they pulled back to now $153.55. So that's about a $30, a 30 day, $30 difference from their all time highs to where they are at. If we look at their revenue, net income, and free cash flow, we can kind of see, let's look at this percentage wise how they have kind of moved over the past 10 years. Very slow company. Again, this is in food diversified. So it's, a, it's sort of like almost like Hormel, Hormel Group. It's either Hormel Group or Hormel Brands, but very slow moving. Let's go ahead and take away the price here and we'll kind of see these revenue up 25%. So around 2 2.5% on average per year, net income up 22% or 2.2% on average per year, and free cash flow kind of negative right now. Not too much of an important stat that I look at, but mainly just uptraining revenue and net income, just very slow, very slow moving company. It's very diversified. I would you know, compare this one to Hormel Foods Corp. Okay, so there we are. If we look at their movement, they are actually moving a little bit faster here. Revenue at 42, net income at 164. So interesting to kind of compare them. I would say they're in the same industry there. So a little bit slower moving. If we look at their earnings per share, let's go ahead and bring in their price to book, price to sales, PE. And I also want to look at their earnings per share over the past 12 months. Look at these in the minor numbers here. So price earnings at 28.59. Their earnings per share has been growing. It did have a bit of a dip here just recently. Let's go to look at the one year. Maybe that's a little bit too, too little data or too much data. Okay, so let's look at five years. 
So over the past five years, 2018, 2017 was pretty rough for them. If we bring in their price, we can probably see their price coming down here. So here in the blue is their price. So 2017 right here was a bit of a rough year. You can see the earnings per share dropping down. The share price dropped down. They they started raising their earnings per share here going into 2018. Stock price followed, had a bit of a peak. You can see peak right here, price peaked out, and their earnings per share began to kind of normalize. They didn't put on a whole lot as far as growth goes. You can see a lot more growth in the past. The earnings began to kind of stabilize and just has been trending sideways, but I do think they're going to be continuing to pick up. I think they're guiding for higher highs in the past. So I think right now they just got a bit of a pullback. They're still getting valued. You can see your earnings has it pulled back from this point. You know, it's, it's a high point compared to where they are right now. But I think compared to where they were at or trading for with the same earnings per share at $180. And now they're trading with that same earnings per share, but they're trading at about $153. I think that puts them at better valuation from where they were in the past. So Price to earnings ratio is at 28.59, could be considered fairly high, but this company doesn't trade really low in valuations. Again, if we look at the history of the PE here, just kind of look at where this is going. It's just uptrending as earnings grow, as, pr as price grows, this just continues to just trend little by little to the upside. If we look at the price of the book, not really a book driven company, it's it's a sales driven company. So we're looking at the sales here. It's at a 3.1 ratio for its sales. So overall, I don't think it's, it's uh, overextended as far as price goes. I think that the price has pulled back from those highs back down. The earnings per share hasn't pulled back a substantial amount to have caused them to have fallen by this much, you know, down I think this is the best bargain down here, or even in this time from here would have been a good opportunity. But I don't look at the past and say, man, I really wish I bought that then. I look at the one year and I say, okay, is this a buying opportunity right in this time frame? Yes, that would have been the best buying opportunity. But here at this pullback, it's not a highs. I'm getting a bit of a discount versus their earnings per share having not pulled back and it's continuing to grow higher right now from where it was in the past. So that's where I see Lancaster Colony, I think here in the short term, I think it's looking like a pretty good deal to add to my portfolio and just begin investing in this company. Return on invested capital is around 20.14. I think that's good. I know a lot of investors, they also like to look at total debt and equivalent. So if we look at this company, let's just look at 10 years. As far as long-term debt, this company has zero. Zero long-term debt, cash and equivalents, $196 million. So very nice there. As far as their operating income and capital expenditures, operating income, $54 million. Capital expenditures, 14.51. So they're taking in more income versus capital expenditures. So that's very nice to see as well. And I think that's kind of all I want to kind of cover as far as those numbers go, total assets, $905 million versus liabilities, $178 million. So overall, I like their financials. Everything stood out pretty positive for Lancaster. That's why I added to my portfolio and just feel pretty safe buying more of it right now. It's actually negative in my portfolio by 2%. So I'm getting a bit of a discount from where I begin to buy this specific company. So let's go ahead and move to number two, Genuine Parts, ticker symbol GPC. Okay, so we're looking at here in the one year. This is actually fairly low for the current time at $96.47, putting it below both 200 day and 50 day moving average and not the highest starting yield, but it's still pretty high for the current time frame of 3.16%. So overall, it's trading near 52 week lows for the past year. If you look at this over the past 10 years, the price fluctuates quite a bit. It has some really high highs where maybe the earnings drives it up really high, investors get really confident, and it pulls back pretty hard. And then it goes high, pulls back, goes high, pulls back, pulls high, pulls back. It just does this pattern, but it's continuously kind of moving. If they were to kind of add some sort of an average in here, we'd see probably move it in this kind of trend. You know, I don't have a you know, a tool that could add an average for the price, but it just continuously gradually moving higher as the company just kind of moves into the future. 
So I think that this point here, with that trading below, it's 250 day moving average, which is kind of one of the lows for the current time frame. I think it offered a good buying opportunity. Now, if we throw in there, price to book, price to sales, PE, and earnings per share, and look at this over the past five years, in the green, earnings per share had a bit of a dip going into the end of 2018. If we bring their price in here, we can probably see, I don't see too much, you know, you can see a little bit of price fall here, end of 2018, bit of a price fall just because of earnings kind of slack off. 2018, earnings begin to rise very quickly. We can see that price also rise as well, but Earnings had a bit of maybe they guided slightly lower on the year, but they're still picking it up. You can see that earnings per share is still pretty high, but the price actually pulled back quite a bit more. You know, investors were pretty confident up to 112, and just because of its earnings, kind of maybe they pulled, you know, they guided a little bit lower, or who knows what the whole reason was behind it, but the price actually fell from around 112 to now $96.47. I think that as long as they kind of maintain their guidance for their earnings per share for 2020, I think that we'll see some price recovery in this company. Plus, it's offering a nice discount as far, you know, in my opinion, its PE ratio is at 17.7. It's priced to book in the orange at 3.8. And it's a sales driven company. This company sells, sar uh, sells car parts. A sales driven, it's a sales company with a ratio of less than one. It has a ratio of one for one for their price of their company versus the sales that they make. It has a 0.7. So their, their price of the company is actually trading for less than their sales numbers, I, you know, the whole ratio there. So a bit of a discount there. I think that's a good number to see. And do we cover the revenue, net income, and free cash flow? I don't believe so. But before going into that, I wanted to show the price oh no we did look at the price okay yeah we did look at the price okay so let's look let's bring in the revenue net income and free cash flow over the past 10 years how has it been over the past 10 years what do i have in your earnings per share that one okay so over the past 10 years we can see free cash flow this has big chunks where it moves higher it moves lower moves higher moves lower moves higher moves lower I'm not worried about the red line. You know, that's pretty normal for this company. It just has highs and lows, and that's normal for its free cash flow. Revenue is in the blue, up 88% or 8.8% on average per year, and free and net income in the orange at 94% or 9.4% on average per year. Both of those numbers are almost double digits. I, I would say that's really good for revenue and net income. If we look at the price in here as well, you know, not a big chunk. I don't think their price really goes with any of the revenue or net income. I think investors kind of expect that this just has, I think this is more of where earnings per share was affecting them versus, you know, I think earnings per share was affecting the price more than revenue and net income. That's just on a constant basis kind of moving up. I don't think that plays too much of a part there with how their price is affected. If you look at their total debt, they do have a lot of debt at 3.14 billion. I would maybe think maybe they're, I don't, you know, I wouldn't know. But I, I think that's a quite a bit. You can see here, end of 2017, they're around 1 billion. Now they're at 3.14 billion. I think I would need to look into that. I should make a note on my notepad here to look into GPC long-term debt. But, you know, don't know what else to say about that. I think it's pretty high for the current time frame. This could be just normal for part companies and cash and equivalents at 333 million. Next, we want to look at operating income and expenditures. So here we have operating income of 283 million and capital expenditures of 75 billion. So income greater than expenses. We can also look at total assets and liabilities. So total assets, 12 billion total liabilities, 9 billion, so assets over liabilities. And I think that is good for that one. So moving on to the third company here that we're going to be buying here on Tuesday, we have our last and final one. This is the Waco Group, ticker symbol W-E-Y-S. We're gonna go ahead and look at it here in the short term, one year. So in the current time frame, Waco Group 
is trading at $23.50, not quite at 52 week lows, but trading very close to 52 week lows, putting it below its 50 day and 200 day moving average. It also has a starting yield of over 4%, which is pretty high for the current time frame. If you look at this company over the past 10 years, you can see there's a huge, huge sell off here from over, let's see, let's look at this in, in the one year here. Okay, so just in one year alone, it went from, where is it, right here? So it went from around $33, $35. Actually, it, looked like a, it looks higher on this chart. We'll say 40. It went from $40 to $23.50 in a very short amount of time. Yeah, that's just crazy to see that kind of a swing there. And we'll kind of look into why that happened here in just a second. But it does generally move in the positive direction. You can see it fluctuates really hard. If, let's go ahead and throw in recessions in here and look at this in the max chart that's available. So this company is pretty old. You know, it's been growing and paying out dividends for the past 38 years. So with that, you know, 38 years ago, they started paying out these dividends. And their company generally moves positive. You can see during the recession here, this last recession in 2008, it took them quite a while to recover where they were at. This company is actually trading below where they were at during the recession. So here they got hit by the recession. They pulled back maybe down into the $25 range. This was actually below the recession price. It's at $23.50. Kind of interesting there. So what drove that price down so hard? Let's look at their revenue, net income, and free cash flow over the past 10 years. Let's look at this percentage-wise and start back up at the top. So revenue increased 34% over 10 years. That's about 3.4%. As you can see, the revenue had a bit of a dip here recently. Let's go ahead and bring in the price. So maybe this is where their dip. So here, revenue, orange, started to dip right about here and kind of maintained it for quite a while. So investors weren't too, uh, you know, they, they weren't too at a loss that their revenue started to decrease for a while. Price actually appreciate, you know, yeah, price appreciated a little bit here. And investors maybe lost a little bit of confidence there, and the stock just kind of fell pretty hard. They were up nearly 60% over the past 10 years. They fell to be about up 3.94%. But recent times, we can see here their revenue in the orange has begun to kind of pick up just a little bit here in the short term, and their free cash flow, what's the orange or red? net income has also begun to kind of pick up. So I'm kind of buying this. I'm looking at it that this company is kind of turning around. You know, it takes a long time for these big companies to turn around, but I think it's showing some return, some signs of returning as far as its revenue and net income and free cash flow kind of fluctuates quite a bit. So that is those numbers, revenue, net income, and free cash flow. Net income and free cash flow were positive. Now the next numbers I want to look at is price to book, price to sales, PE, and earnings per share. Maybe we'll look and see another reason why these were kind of dragged down here. So here is that little time frame where they lost quite a bit. Um, yeah, we'll look at five years. So price was kind of, we, we remember this is that little point right here where the revenue started to decrease. So during this point, the earnings per share began to decrease as well. And their investors kind of lost, you know, the, their investors weren't really, they didn't really lose confidence. They just kind of kept chugging sideways for a while. They showed a little bit of signs of recovery and the stock price shot to some all time highs. They haven't had a bit of a pullback in their earnings per share. Their earnings per share is still moving higher. It hasn't actually pulled back at all. So, uh, you know, looking at where their price is at, and we see we saw that their revenue, their net income, and their earnings per share is now showing signs of recovery. I am not sure why their price has not recovered yet. So this one would actually be a really good one for me to kind of focus on, put more money towards. I think the main reason that this one is getting hit so hard is just because it's part of the retail it's in that text apparel, footwear, and accessories. And I think a lot of investors and just the market as a whole is kind of hitting these specific companies in the sector a little bit harder just because retails, you know, a lot of investors are seeing that it's dying. I think it's just over oversold here in the short term. So it is at $23.50. So price the book is in the orange at a 1.1. So basically a one for one of the book value and the price 
and its sales, which is a sales driven company, is at 0.77. So both of those are at nearly a one or below. So you're basically getting this for a book value of the company for a price and you're buying it for the, you know, they're producing more sales versus where they're trading as far as price goes. So I think both of those numbers show good value in the company. It's PE ratio is at a 10.98, putting it at one of the lowest points in the past five years. You can see here that over the past 10 years, it's PE had hit highs of 32. You know, we can see the average as of this point right here, if we just draw a line, say right here, their average PE over the 10 year period had been around 29 or so. And just recently they had a pullback with their price from 40 or so dollars down to 23 and their PE dropped a large amount of, you know, their earnings per share is still growing, but their price has fallen so fast that it just kind of, it, it went low fast. So it's now at a 10.98. So I think value wise, I think Waco group is showing one of the best value opportunities out there just because it does have growing earnings per share. It does have signs of recovery in their revenue and their net income. And their price is still pretty low. It's trading near 52 week lows and actually 10 year lows. <laughs> so kind of interesting. So those are the three companies I'm planning on buying. Lancaster goes ex-dividend in March again. So we'll kind of cover when these go ex-dividend one last time. So Lancaster goes ex-dividend on the 7th of March. GPC, Genuine Auto Parts, goes ex-dividend also right around the 7th of March. And Waco Group goes ex-dividend around the 14th of March. So you'll probably, I probably won't be covering too much of these companies in the future, but I will be continuing to buy more of these three companies, especially Waco Group. I think that if I were to kind of look at a price target for them, I, I do think that they had a high of around $40. I could definitely see them pulling back to get into anywhere from $25 to $32. That would be my price estimate for this company. You can see here some, it might have some resistance for about $28, but once it breaks that resistance and stays at $28 and higher, it can move to new highs or just go back up to highs of $40. So I could definitely see some recovery there. So those are the three companies I am planning on buying here on Tuesday and will probably continue to buy into the future until they go ex-dividend and so on. So that is going to be it for today's video. Let me know in the comment section below. What do you think? Do you agree with my three buys? Do you own any of these? Lancaster, Genuine Parts, or Waco Group? Do you think any of them look a bit risky to you? Let me know that as well in the comment section below. And also let me know what are you buying here this week or what have you bought here in February? Are you excited to see where the market kind of moves into the future or are you a little bit cautious? So that is going to be it for today's video. Again, if you have not yet subscribed to this channel, I would really appreciate if you do subscribe to the channel, hit that red button below, cover the stock market, dividends, real estate, personal finance. If you do enjoy this video or found it helpful and entertaining, definitely give this video a thumbs up and drop me a comment, any comment at all, <laughs> drop it down there and just say hi. <laughs> and that is it. Thank you all for tuning in. I will see you next time. Have a great day. Bye.